All right, thank you for joining. I'm Johnny Hausner, and I'm going to be talking about Minurex today and what it takes to win a convention and nationals, and uh, hopefully going to do some Q&A at the end. Um, I kind of broke down into little subcategories what I think is, is most important uh, to, to raising a good rabbit and exhibiting specifically at conventions and nationals. Um, and I broke it into, number one, knowing your standard, knowing your breed standard, and um, how to breed a good rabbit. Timing, I think if you're gonna win a convention or winning, winning um, a national, timing is probably one of the most important aspects of that. Uh, your grooming, grooming, conditioning, animal husbandry skills, uh, good luck, and then what to do when you're at the show. So I'm just gonna kind of briefly talk about each of those. And um, number one is knowing your standard because above all else, uh, you should have your standard of perfection and you should read it and understand it. That's the most important thing. And there are subjective parts uh, and that's kind of where the judging um, comes into play, interpreting the standard and why animals kind of place differently at different shows because it is a bit subjective, some of the, some of the parts in our standard. But anytime anyone works with me on their breed or if they work with me for a judge's test or whatnot, I always go through the standard with them and I have them circle important words, breed specific words, because those are what makes our breed, mini Rex or any other breed, more important or different or more special than other breeds. So that's kind of what I did here is I went through my standard and I circled words that were breed specific and really important to making a good mini Rex. Um, before I do that, I'm going to see if I can share my screen and show you the points breakdown the way that I see it here. All right, let me see if I can share my screen. You're good, Ian. So I can share my screen now? Okay, so I broke down the breed standard into two main parts. So if you can see, the first part is on body type. Body type being our top line, our muscle quality, our bone structure, including our head, our ear, our tail, our legs. Um, and if you add all those points up in the standard, it comes to 45 points. The, the Rex fur and the coat itself is broken down between fur being 35 points and color being 15. And if I just looked at the pelt itself, when you'll see me when I stretch the animal out and only look at its pelt, that's worth 50 points of the animal. Condition then being its own category being five because I do believe that condition plays into both aspects of our animal because we can't have a, a malnourished animal or an animal that's extremely molting that's gonna win a classic convention. So con condition, while it's only worth five points, might actually be the most important aspect of our, of our whole animal. Um, so let's start with body type because body type, and I'll pull up an animal And I will preface this by saying I no way say that this is the, the most close animal to our breed standard that, that we can look at, but it's just one that was in decent condition that I pulled out. Her name is Immunity because I was watching Survivor and, and that's the name that she got this spring. Um, anyways, so when I pose up an animal, just like all compact breeds, we're looking for body length. We're looking for a short, compact body but we don't want it so short that we have that real rigid top line that peaks in the middle of the back and then and then slopes off. Granted, this her top line is not the greatest um, example of a top line. You want it to start at a gradual rise from the base of the neck, come peak over the hips here, so I'd move her top line back, and then into right down throughout her hind quarter. You also look, and I can't move my computer up over her for that taper that starts at the shoulder, tapers back into a well-developed hindquarter and fills out um, and down to the ground. So we're looking at width of her body, width of that midsection into that, into that hindquarter and how well it fills out. I can't really see what I'm looking at here. There we go. And how well it fills out to the base of that table. A really common fault in mini Rex, and granted, like I said, she's probably not the greatest example, is a really pinched lower hindquarter where our hind quarter, our hind legs kind of taper in quite a bit 
and they chop off where where she's very narrow and pinched underneath, and that is a breed fault. So you want to be you want to be mindful of our animals' bodies um, because it is almost 50% of our point breakdown. You want to look how hollow and uh, she is over the hips here, running your hand over, making sure that you can squeeze a good amount of that loin, that the loin is both deep and wide, and it blends very smoothly over those hip joints into the hindquarter. Down. Um, one other disqualification would be a, a low or a long shoulder. So if her shoulder probably could stand to be a little bit tighter, a little bit deeper, but we want to make sure that our animal doesn't have a, a long shoulder that's low and long like that, making her look more um, semi-arched in, in body type or, or, uh, or whatnot. Um, we're looking for ears and head, obviously. We're looking for um, head that balances well. And just like all breeds, balance is a very important word. You want it to be set close to those shoulders. You want it to be pretty full and wide, you know, a little bit wider in bucks than in does probably. But the standard specifically says they're not looking for a blocky Netherland dwarf type head, which might be surprising because at least myself, I like the bucks with the big, thick, chunky heads, but it's not what we like. Unfortunately, it's what the standard says. So she is a doe. She does have um, a little more refined head than, than some bucks might have. Ears, and um, I'm going to go over equipment in a little bit, but this will be one of your really best friends, uh, a ruler, whether you're judging your own rabbits at home or you see judges at convention, you're going to be looking at your ear length. And um, the Minurex specifically disqualifies for ears over three and a half inches. And the way to measure those ears right down to the, to the skull, I'm not pushing down too hard. And um, I'm just measuring up the length of her ear. And really you want it to balance well. If you have a little bit larger animal, your ears are gonna be a little longer. She's a little smaller doe. Um, and her ears are only about two and a half inches long. This is our three and a half, our three mark, and our three and a half is all the way up here. So quite a ways uh, for her ears to still grow. Um, so let's move on from body because I feel like body is very similar um, to a lot of our other compact breeds. You want a really well-defined body. Fur is what's make is what makes this breed special. And um, again, I print enough words, breed specific words that has to do with fur. Dense, so we're gonna look for density and texture. Uh, you want it to be straight, upright, plentiful guard hairs, which we're gonna talk about in a second because I think that's a common misconception that the Rex coat doesn't have guard hairs or shouldn't have guard hairs when it's actually the opposite. The standard specifically says we need plentiful guard hairs. We just don't want them to be too long or noticeable. You want the coat to be lustrous, um, not with a sheen, but a healthy luster. And, and you, and at least I as a judge, I can step back and look at animals in, in their cage and I can see that luster coming off of a coat. And you can really tell when a coat is, is dead, when it doesn't have quite the coat quality, uh, because it has almost a curly, dull look to it. Uh, it lacks luster. And that's one reason I specifically love whites and broken blacks, and, and uh, because they show that off really well. Uh, the other words are springy. Hopefully you've noticed judges doing this to a Rex coat before, looking for the spring and the resiliency, and I'll explain why in a second. Five eighths of an inch, smooth and even. Now, before we go any further, we need to understand what a Rex coat is. A Rex coat is a mutation. It, it's a, a mutation where it takes the, the longer, coarser guard hairs of a coat and that plush, dense undercoat that most breeds have, and it, and it makes them exactly the same length in a perfect world, where we have our guard hairs and our plush undercoat um, being the same length. Sometimes our plush, uh, very soft cottony undercoat gets too long and it becomes a soft wavy coat that's really undesirable and probably my least favorite type of Rex coat. Sometimes uh, we have guard hairs which are a little too long and that causes a drag or some 
resistance to the coat or even some coarseness to the coat. So in a perfect world, our guard hairs and our undercoat are the same length. Now, the disqualification that comes with the Rex coat is the length. And if I ask, if I ask most people, if they could point to five eighths of an inch on a ruler, I would be surprised if they could tell me where it is, or at least kids, because I teach sixth grade and I guarantee you they couldn't. So I printed off a little inch roller here. The minimum length for a Rex coat is a half inch, which is surprisingly long. A lot of mini Rex coats are too short. Admittedly, her coat is right on minimum length. I like to see a little more length on coats, pushing the pushing probably the max length. Um, but a lot of mini Rex coats are too short. So I would encourage you to take a ruler as you're checking your rabbit's ears and to also check the length of your coats, your pelts. I've never seen a mini Rex or a Rex for that matter disqualified for coat length. Um, but it could happen. Max length is almost a full inch, and that's quite long. And now you have to keep in mind that Rex and Mini Rex share the same standard when it comes to the Rex coat, same lengths. So seven eighths inch is, inch is our max, and then that five eighths right in the middle there um, is our ideal length. What you're looking for is a dense coat. Now, when I assess density, and I can't really show you probably too well with my, with my uh, computer, but I like to stretch the animals out. And it might look funny, and you might think, what is that judge doing? But really, you're assessing the pelt, all aspects of it, because you need every aspect of that coat to be even, from the base of the flanks, all the way up to the tips of the shoulders, over the back, and even truly on the belly, we're looking for evenness um, and density and texture all over this coat, especially the usable portions, because we want to be able to pelt her out and, and use her uh, in it, you know, if we wanted to. So I like to stroke the rabbit um, backwards. And if I see the fur parting, if I see any skin, if the coat parts and falls backwards, to me, that's a poor quality Rex coat. I don't want to see that coat move. And I don't know how well you can see this, but if I could see that her skin, I would say that that coat is way too thin and lacks density. Don't be fooled with false density. And I heard uh, this in the Angora presentation too. False density gets judges all the time and it might even get some new breeders, but as I go through and judge these animals, I blow right into that coat and I look down to make sure I can see skin. White, clean, healthy skin, right? If I see, uh, if I see fur coming up through that and if I cannot see the skin when I part the coat, then that animal is becoming double coated, which means there's a new coat pushing through. Those animals often feel the densest. They feel great sometimes. Oftentimes they win classes, especially with people who are inexperienced at judging the Rex coat. But to me, especially at a convention or a national, you should see judges blowing into the coat either this way, which is the way I do it, as I can see an entire band's worth of, of a primeness, I guess, or sometimes you'll see judges just blowing into a specific spot. You might be able to assess density somewhat that way as well, depending on how tight that little ringlet is, um, similar to Angora's, but you can assess density in multiple ways. You're also looking for texture of coat. Now, I think it's a common misconception and virtually, like most things, it's not going to be ideal, but you're not looking for a soft coat. Actually, if I'm looking at the faults, if I'm looking at faults for the Rex coat, look at this, lacks density, obviously. Uneven because it's unfinished. 
it hasn't been well groomed, it's not mature enough, unevenness is a big fault as well. Harshness, if it's too coarse and I feel a drag and I feel a lot of guard hairs protruding, softness, cottoniness, and silkiness are all faults. Oftentimes I find new breeders or new judges loving the softness and the silkiness of a coat but truly, if you have a coat that is soft, soft, like, like cotton, then you, your coat is too soft, too cottony. And what that does is it creates sore hoff problems. And, and that's one reason I said earlier that I prefer coats that are a little more harsh as opposed to a little too soft and cottony because those cottony rabbits often have the health problems that go along with not enough pads on their feet, um, I find them to be a little more vulnerable to sickness because um, they don't have quite as much, uh, I don't know, they, they just seem to be more res uh, resistant to, or less resistant to illness. Other faults, dull, lackluster, so it doesn't have that glow, that primeness, might be sunburnt, might be uh, a dying coat, it's dying back. Um, noticeable noticeable protruding guard hairs or um, lacks that springy resistance. Now, that resistance comes from that density, comes from those guard hairs being properly distributed throughout the coat. And it, it might be a little overexposed here, our camera, but as I pat this coat, it's bouncing back into place. It's not, it's not necessarily sinking down in there and falling over, falling back, Right? I can pat it and it's pushing back against me. It's almost like that, that resilient, that resistance. Um, so where was I going with this? That, I guess that's a brief overview of the Rex coat. Probably the most paramount feature of this breed. It's what makes this breed unique. It's what makes it special. It, it's what, why this is a breed as opposed to, you know, the other breeds that we have in our standards. As I'm judging, um, and this will kind of play into husbandry or you know getting ready for the show, you should be working with your rabbits constantly. You should be posing your animals, grooming your anim animals. And um, what I like to do as a judge is I pose the animal, especially the top place animals, and then I'll step back and make sure that she can hold her form. Sometimes, and like I said, I'm not proclaiming this to be the best example of a mini Rex. If you let them go, they'll just flop right over and, you know, and flop down because we can make a rabbit look really, really good if, if we're, um, I don't want to over poser here, but we can really make a rabbit look good by holding onto their heads and, and crushing their pressure points and, and making them look good. But the test comes when you let them go, do they sink in? Or do they hold that form? So you want to be working with your rabbits all the time. And, and that kind of goes into my second point of my, of my multiple points I want to talk about is timing. The timing is everything. And, and this is going to come when, when you know your line of rabbits, you know your environment, you know how your feed reacts to your animals is because mini Rex and Rex and other fur breeds that hold 50% of their point structure on this coat being prime, you need, to, you need to make sure your animal is prime. For me and my animals, that's juniors who are almost seniors, five and a half months old. That's about what this girl is. She's about five and a half months old and young seniors. So I'm not waiting for my seniors to molt and then come back into another prime as that's going to take a lot of effort, especially if I've uh, been breeding rabbits and uh, oops, my screen popped away, especially if she's the does have been having litters and the bucks have been breeding a lot. It's a lot harder to, to get a rabbit back into condition, I find, than, than to breed and um, have animals at the proper age. Um, a lot of really, really good breeders, some of our best breeders, only show twice a year. They show at nationals and they show at convention. So they're taking a calendar, and I have one here somewhere. I always have a calendar. 
must have put it somewhere, but they're looking at what day is show day and they're counting back. Okay, I want juniors that are five and a half months old. They're counting back five and a half months from that day. And then obviously another month counting for gestation, six and a half months, they should be breeding those animals. Remember that juniors, and this is really nice with mini rex, can be bumped up into a higher category. So you have a junior doe who's now exceeded the max weight. We can bump her up into a senior doe class with a beautiful junior prime, her first prime. And um, those animals often do really well at shows. So I would encourage you uh, to pay really close attention to the calendar and planning accordingly. The other thing that goes into winning a convention is constant grooming. And I love this little, this little device here. It's a little mister. It, it's hard to even see the water come out because it comes out so fine as I spray my computer here. Um, and it just missed. You know, this thing's available on Amazon for, for dollars and you're going to get great use out of it. You should be grooming your convention you should be grooming your nationals entry daily. And I'm not joking when I say daily or at the very minimum, every other day, you know, a good month or so before convention. The quicker you get those dead hairs out of that coat, the quicker you, you can go over this coat just with your hand and pull out those dead hairs, the quicker your rabbit is going to prime, the easier it's going to be able to groom on show day or after you get to the show and the more competitive it's going to be. I've judged convention, mini Rex at convention multiple times. I've judged nationals a couple of times and it is very apparent who has taken time to groom their animals and get them ready for show. And it's really apparent and there's hair tough sticking out and, and you know, there are things out of our control like your animal's about to molt. We can't do anything about that. Your animal's going to molt, it's natural. But if we timed it appropriately, we know our lines and we're going out there grooming, getting them ready for show, then, then we should be in a much better shape. You know, it's not easy to show a rabbit. I think a lot of people have the misconception that rabbit shows are easy. And I would argue it's the opposite. A week, if you think it's easy, I think you're doing something wrong because you should be spending quite a bit of time grooming every animal in preparation for that show. Even if I have a local show coming up, I will take that rabbit out every night, you know, the weeks leading up to the show or every couple nights and really grooming to get that, that coat in as prime shape as possible. Because think about it, once you get to a show, especially a convention or a national where you might be driving for hours or flying with your animal, your animal's gonna be stressed out. We want to reduce the stress as much as possible on the animal once once they get to that show because they're going to be under enough stress stress with the lights and the sounds and the smells and and all the different things that are going on so we want to do everything we can and do to ensure that our rabbit um stands the best chance on the show table as possible and i put on my um <laughs> I put on my list of things. So I put know the standard timing, grooming, conditioning. I also put luck, which, you know, luck is what it is. Because animals are going to freak out when they get to a show, especially a big show like convention. There's gonna be new sounds, new smells, like I said. The more we can do to prepare our rabbits for being at the big show, the better chance you're gonna have that your animal's going to cooperate on the table. And I can tell you from experience, um, judging a class of 50 rabbits, if, you know, 50 caster senior does or, you know, 40 black junior bucks, whatever it might be, if your animal's honoring and pushing and fighting and jerking around, we can give them the benefit of the doubt for so long, but it only lasts for so long because if you have 40, rabbits or you're doing a broken class with 120 you know senior does you can only look at that rabbit so long before you have to move on to the next one preparing your rabbit is key um like i said getting them out posing them stepping away maybe putting them in a carrier or in a in a show coop and and get them let them know what it feels like to be at a show or traveling um 
when you get to the show, other things I would suggest are taking your own water, your own feed, if it's not a popular brand of feed that convention might be providing. Like I said, you want to reduce the stress as much as possible. Um, a big fault would be, you know, a, a rough, a rough fleshed animal. Because as soon as they feel bony and they don't feel as good, they don't show as well. And, you know, we can only control so much. But that is one thing that we can we can help control. Um, I'm trying to think here. What else I wanted to say to you guys? Um, so, yeah, luck plays into it a little bit. Like I said, you have 100 rabbits in a class. Your animal needs to look its best, show itself off. It needs to keep itself clean. It can't, you know, pee all over itself on the way to the show. So luck does play into it just a little bit. Um, like I said, the standard is somewhat subjective at parts, whether we like it or not. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think that's a lot of, of what I have prepared for you. I do have other animals here I could show you, um, but. Yeah, but I have some questions for Dan. Yeah. The, uh, the first one is, with you bringing up grooming, how long do you think is ideal for grooming or how long would you recommend grooming before a show? Uh, before a show, um, so when you know your rabbit's in a molt and you know a show's coming up, a big show like convention or, or nationals, you might start at least a, you know, a month ahead of time. Because what I think, and David, you could chime in too, you've raised many rex probably longer than I have, is that the sooner, the quicker you get that old dead coat out, the quicker that new coat's going to come in and, and prime out. That's, that's what I think. Yeah, uh, no, I, I agree. Yeah, I think that it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's longer than just doing it like a couple days or a week before. Oh, think, yeah, yeah. So. so for sure, even, even a week isn't going to do it. I don't think a lot of times I, I ran home from work and I didn't have much time to do a lot of grooming, but this is, this is one of my favorite rabbits. Oh, and it might be hard to see. He, he just has fur flying out of him everywhere. But if I would take time to really get him ready and, and groom him I think he could be a, a real good rabbit but I can't think that I can just throw him on the table you know this weekend or, or this afternoon and think he's going to be ready to go no so yeah Dave do you have any other questions or constants yeah 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 I, I do I, I have several you're good uh so I mean some of the pop or popular colors in mini rex are obvious or there's a million colors in mini rex but popular ones are definitely broken is the most popular and other ones are, are black and otter, which I know you had, said you had some examples of. Um, do like, can you, like what makes an ideal black coat or black color? And then how does that translate into broken? Sure, no, that's a good question. And, and this goes with, I think, all varieties is that if, you, if your coat is primed out, it's gonna have that quality of that luster, that, that glow almost, that when you look at it just from in a cage, you think that's a beautiful coated animal. Blacks specifically, you want to make sure there's no scattered white hairs in that coat. And I just wish I could show you his coat. And that's one thing I love about him so much is that I could take him into the dead of the sun. And, and I would recommend you doing that because our barns are dark. They have shadows. It's shady. Take your animals out into the sun and look at that coat. Look for white hairs, no matter what color you have. And, and if you're finding a lot of scattered white hairs, that's only going to spoil that coat. If you're seeing brownish tinge to the coat, or a urine stain, or a dyeing coat, all of that's going to really hurt your chances at, at doing well at a show. Obviously, if you think of like a Goody's, um, color is a lot harder to achieve because you're thinking not only about the surface color, and you know, blacks do have a, should have a that sleep under color and the color we could assess how far it runs down the hair shaft but few judges do that they just really look at that surface color but at goodies judges are really paying attention to um the the intensity of the color the width of the band the evenness of that surface color the belly color the lap spots so i, I hate to say it but i do feel like other colors like a goody you know they get a they get a hard a hard time because there's a lot more that goes into those varieties than than a solid black or a white and um you know colors with 15 points so so it's gonna it's gonna be hard to 
it's hard. Do you do you have an ex or do you have an otter with you? Uh, I didn't bring one. I can I can go grab one. I just didn't have any that had condition enough. Honestly, the only, the only thing I was curious on is if you had one that has example of like great otter factor or something like that. We show. Like, I don't think I do. Okay, uh, no, okay. Not not to the point where I would be proud to say this is a good this is a good otter color. Honestly. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, and like, I mean, along the lines of otters, though, like, what, what is the, like, what type of color traits are you looking for in that variety? Um, so otter, the otter factor uh, creates, it's basically like an agouti, where we have the jowl markings, the nostril markings, the ear lacing, um, the, the lighter uh, belly that needs to have color underneath it. Uh, the triangle behind the ears, and and you are, we need to see that intensity of color. Uh, a lot of times we step back at an otter, and they have really really faint eye circles, or almost no no jowl marking, or the the triangle is faded or or mealy, or they don't have color, um, the under color on their belly, and uh, all those are are big faults. Um, but otter can be a real pretty color when you when you get it right. What, um, one of the things I know, this is changing the topic again, the brokens. one of the things that I know that's happening with next standard is that uh, we're switching away from the 10 and 50% rule. Um, but like, what would be an oh, ideal yeah. pattern on the Minurex? Well, I, I did grab this dough for that reason specifically. Thank you for reminding me. Um, this dough, as of now, with the way our standard is, um, would probably be a disqualification in my in my view, because currently the standard says that ten under ten percent more than fifty percent color is a disqualification. Now, you can see that she does have some color on her belly, on her on her chest. I think judges have been way too lenient on pattern, because um, it still is in our standard that this is a DQ currently. Um, going forward. All brokens in our standard are going to be uh, under the same under the same standard. Where this will now be a fault. Is it going to be a fault? Am I right, David? I believe I believe you're correct that it's that it's a fault, but it's still fine to show as long as it meets the what right. we view as being broken. And what I the exact verbiage, but it's like that. Yeah, I should have printed it out to be 100% sure, but. The, the new disqualifications will be so heavy pattern that it resembles a booted, meaning that this color then would run probably all the way through the chest up into her elbow joints. And only really the, the only white that she would have on her body would probably be the, the, her feet and everything else would basically be black. Um, personally, I find that really unattractive. I, I don't breed for heavy patterns like this. I really like the, the more spotted pattern look like the other doe had. Um, really, there's no preference giving as long as it's somewhat even and balanced in, in pattern. Um, and then the other disqualification would be to be so light. It looks like a Charlie. And I don't have examples of these things with me. I, I just found I was doing this presentation or I would have found some pictures. But um, I call for those things because, and honestly, I just, she made the cut because I do like her, but typically an animal that's this heavy patterned wouldn't be put into my breeding program. I just find it unattractive. So. She still looks pretty. I love her type and her coat, her coat looks amazing. So I, yeah. I can understand. Yeah. Um, what, a, uh, what is the yeah, most memorable I class? I don't want to interrupt you, but um, the other thing I was going to mention that kind of came to my head is how Mini Rex is changing from varieties to groups. And that's an important change in our standard too, that currently all our varieties show individually, and then they compete against all varieties for best of breed. And the way it's going to be in the future is we're going to have, is it six groups, David? You would, you would actually know better than I would. I know that that was the original proposal, but I Yeah, so I believe what, uh, what was approved is that it's going to be very similar to like a Jersey Woolly standard where we're going to have the agoutis showing with each other. So they're still going to show as varieties where you're going to have caster show links 
uh, show, then you're going to have Opal show. And, but what happens then after the varieties are all done is those varieties compete against each other for a best of group title. Really, the only thing is that does is it gives some rare varieties, like oh, we have all these new shaded varieties coming into our standard, uh, a chance to earn legs. Uh, because that will be a new leg category is if you have five rabbits and three exhibitors in the group, you only have, maybe you only have one opal, one lynx and three casters. Well, those five rabbits then could compete against each other and win a best of group leg. It also makes life a little easier on the judge as opposed to having, I mean, what do we have now? 20 varieties, I believe, after uh, Sable was just added. Um, instead of having 20 different varieties lined up, we're now going to have, you know, six, the best of each group, uh, then that will, they will compete against best of breed. So that's an important change as well. Um, all right, what were we going to ask, David? That, that was a great point. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's definitely a, that's a major change that's going to happen in the breed. Yes, and that, uh, that will come into effect um, once the new standard is out. What? It should be soon. This fall. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that starts on January first of twenty twenty one. That should start on January first of twenty twenty one. That's correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. So my next question is: What is the most memorable class or variety um, that you've judged in Mini Rex, whether nationals or convention? Like most competitive or whatever reason was most memorable. Um, so, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell um, uh, an embarrassing, I guess not embarrassing, but a, a truthful story that I don't know if any other judges will watch this or anyone else will watch this, but, you know, it's an honor to get to judge uh, groups and, and varieties and breeds at convention and um, hopefully, you know, you're spending all this money to enter a rabbit that you want experienced judges who know what they're doing. Well, my first year having my judge's license and David I'm sure remembers this very well I was um, asked to judge casters and open open casters at convention and and it's tough you know judging a convention class is tough there's a lot of pressure you know from exhibitors looking down on you there's a lot of cameras and there's a lot of really competitive animals especially in an open in an open um, variety at convention and I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I completely messed up, but I would say to any new judges who might watch this, that definitely consider um, the pressure and the experience that you need before jumping in and accepting a, a breed like mini Rex at convention. You know, there might be some smaller breeds that would help get you prepared, or you might need, you know, you might want to take uh, a couple years to really learn how to place large classes because it is really a skill in and of itself is receiving 50, 75, 100 plus rabbits that all look the same and being able to sort them where, where you're not, where you're justifying your placements and giving the animals uh, ample time. And, and that's kind of where, where my fourth one luck comes in because sometimes, you know, we get a judge who's inexperienced, who's like I was that year, you know, I only had my license for a couple months and I was judging one of the most competitive classes, arguably, at convention. And um, I'm really proud I did it. That rabbit went on to win best opposite sex to breed. And, um, and I appreciated breeders coming to me afterwards in a polite way and showing me things that they would have done differently. So even though I had the breed and I understood, uh, I felt like I understood the breed, it's hard to judge convention. It, it takes experience, it takes confidence. Um, so that's, that would be my advice to new judges is just really think about what you're going to accept and judge before you just jump in. My most memorable rabbit, and where was this? I think it was a, it was a black doe, and I don't know if we were in Texas, but it was a youth diff rabbit. It was one of my favorite mini Rex I've ever judged. Um, it was a youth black doe, and I think we were judging nationals in Texas, and it won hands down, beautiful rabbit. Um, for, for best of breed. Yeah. Gotcha. I, like, I, like, I like that one. Uh, one other question that you have, just like along those same lines, though, 
Uh, you've had the opportunity to judge best in show at convention. Um, you know, what is, what is that like? And uh, you know, what is it like handling those top four animals that are going for that cover of award? Sure. I mean, I guess that probably could be one of the, the highlights of what I've accomplished while judging and some say it's a you know a popularity contest to judge because it's based on votes and who gets the amount of votes and and a lot of that has to do with location of um of convention you know often you know if the conventions out west those judges might get more votes because more people come from that area so when the convention was in pennsylvania i was fortunate enough to judge youth best in show and uh Again, it, it's nerve wracking. It's it's an honor um, and something that you need to take really seriously. Um, take time to evaluate each animal and whether it's at a local show you're doing best to show or if it's at a convention, people are putting a lot of their own personal emotions and it's true blood, sweat and tears into getting these animals prepared. Um, for a show, you know, they're spending their own money to drive, to get a hotel, to pay gas money, to pay entry fee. So it's not, you know, whether you're judging best in show at a local county fair or um, convention, I think it's something that that really could be the highlight of someone's whole year. It could be the highlight of someone's whole career raising rabbits. Um, so, so you need to take it seriously. As always, I encourage judges to, to pose their animal and to take a hands-off approach and just to look at it. You need that animal to be able to hold its pose, to hold its structure, because I think we can make animals look really good when we put our hands, we see all those pictures where the, the hand is on the head and, and the picture's like this. Well, we can make a rabbit look really, really good. Um, but the true test is, can you, can you let go? And will the animal still hold its shape or will they sink down and and can you move around and, and look at that animal from all angles? So I don't know if that answered your question or that was just a big long rant, but um, it's something that, that we need to take serious as judges. Yeah. I was, just, or I was uh, curious, so uh, you know, that was a good answer. They, uh, the last question I have uh, along the same lines of, I mean, with being at the national level and, and getting to judge those big classes, um, what realistically do you have when you're thinking about cuts or like how do you end up saying wow you know i know this rabbit's not going to end up getting into the top half of the class so i can just no place it and move on or you know what what makes it into that top 10 or to the top five in the class winners that's a really good question um so i think as an exhibitor people watching oftentimes scratch their heads and they think what what are they doing you know sometimes we'll use coins or poker chips or cards or any number of things to help sort through a class of you know 50 or 100 rabbits and and you need to develop a system obviously with a fur breed if it's an animal that's completely out of condition in a molt just isn't timed correctly for the day they need to be a no place animal they're just not prepared I think then um, we, you need to evaluate, and this is where I think it becomes somewhat subjective, is that we need to evaluate the animal's body type. We need to evaluate the primeness of the animal and, um, and break down those points in our heads. And how, how would I say that the animals break down? I think you, oftentimes I feel like when I see an animal that's gonna place in the top 10, the top 15, I, you just know it because it just has that wow factor. You pose it and it's deep and it's round, it's wide, it's in great condition. You can step back and really view the animal and think that rabbit's got it. I think probably the harder task for judges is to judge, you know, 10 through 25 or whatever it might be, because there's a lot of points in there that that you have to weigh in your head. Well, what's what's better than than the other than the other? I'll show you a good example. I pulled out, and and different lines of rabbits have different features. I I pulled out this rabbit. I hate his body type. Um, I, but he's got probably one of the best 
coats in my barn. He's he's just a young rabbit, but so dense. He, when I stand back and look at him from when I'm feeding, I can just see the density. I can see the that luster to his coat, and and I just know he has it. If I was judging him at convention, though, and, and honestly, I doubt he'll even make it into my breeding program because he has this long, low shoulder. He slopes off. He doesn't have a good top line. But to me, finding a buck with such great fur, and um, some breeders will say that fur and density is actually a doe trait. Does often win um, fur breeds. And for whatever reason, a lot of people consider uh, density and fur to be a, more of a feminine trait, um, whether that's true or not. I can't tell you, but I do love to find a buck that has really, really a great coat. Um, as you're placing them at convention, though, you have to weigh, all right, well, this rabbit has maybe some of my best fur, but I really don't like his body. So then we need to see, do we have a, a more well-balanced animal on top? of this one. Can we find an animal with a little bit better body? Maybe we're giving off a little fur, but we have a, a stronger body. Or we might find an animal that we, we have a much stronger fur, but we're giving up a little body. And, and that's kind of where those points and the subjectivity come into play in my, in my mind. Um, again, I don't know if I answered your question, but the top 10 animals, I feel like as a judge, you see them and you know them. You're like, wow, that animal stands out. I can put it in the coop behind me and really take my time then at the end and, um, and check it out. It's that middle of the road group where you're thinking, all right, what points, where am I placing these points? What does this animal have that the other ones don't have um, that become a little bit more subjective? All right, and I'll let, uh... One of the viewers, go ahead and ask their questions. Okay, um, so I was wondering, when you're evaluating like who you're gonna keep in your program or not, what do you think is like the most important thing as like, if they had like a hitch when you were dragging your line across them or they're really hippie, would you keep them? Uh, no. So I think, and I'm trying to think how I can say this. Um, you, you should only breed with the very best. I always tell people who are just getting into rabbits to find the best stock available and, and buy it. You know, find the best that your money, what you can spend, you should buy. Because you want to start with really good rabbits and only build better rabbits. I find a lot of times, for example, someone will win maybe a mini rex in a raffle table at a local show not the greatest way to get into a breed honestly you know it sometimes people donate gorgeous animals to to raffles sometimes people dump their junk into raffles and i hate to say it like that but but it's true so you need to find what i would always say is find the best that your money can buy and and only breed with a very few, a select few rabbits, the very best. And that's why I say, you know, I have 60 holes in my barn. Um, a lot of those are grow out cages because we want to constantly be breeding and producing new rabbits and, and making better ones. So every generation, you're making better rabbits. If I was going to add him into my breeding program, as amazing as his fur is, I feel like I would only go backwards. So if you find an animal you have is really hippy, has large pin bones coming out the back, this low shoulder like this buck has, you don't breed with mediocre rabbits. If you only have one or two really, really, really good rabbits and you have five mediocre so-so rabbits, my advice would be, and you know, remember this is only my advice. So take it with a grain of salt use it as a tool in your toolbox and think about it and make your own decisions. But I would say only breed with the best few. And then hopefully that next generation, you might have a really even better rabbit. And now you have three really good rabbits and, and, you build, and you build your line that way. I would also encourage you and most people to not just buy and buy and buy. I find a lot of new breeders go out and they'll buy 
tons of rabbits. And I, and I think this is one reason that we have such a high turnover rate in our hobby. It's because someone will buy a rabbit from this breeder and a rabbit from that breeder and find a rabbit in an auction here. And I think you should uh, you know, breed a select few rabbits and then build your line. What that will do is create consistency for you. When you're grabbing genetics from all over, we can breed those into a line. It just takes longer. But if you're constantly introducing new rabbits, um, in my opinion, it's going to be harder to make consistent rabbits. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any? You said you had a lot, so ask away. Um, I was also wondering. So I'd, I've done a lot of like virtual shows, and I've noticed that like some rabbits, while they might have like a great view from the top, they look awful from the back. But like sometimes they'll do great in that virtual class, but then on the table they do awful. So like, what do you think is like the best view that it's like you want to look for, like the top, the back, or like the side? Uh, honestly, my answer is going to be all of it. Okay. And I'll tell you, know, this is, I'll explain why. Virtual shows are nothing more than a fun show, all right? And it's fun, and I understand we're in the midst of a pandemic. We can't go to shows. Virtual shows are a great outlet for right now. You know, they are giving us a way to show off our hard work and to have fun while remaining socially distant and safe. But they're nothing more than a fun show. The best way that you you can evaluate your animals is by getting your hands on it. And, and I always tell people, really get your hands on the animal. See how I'm squeezing this buck? I want to know what that animal feels like underneath this beautiful pelt. And I do think you need to look at all angles of that animal without your hands. And, and honestly, I'll tell you, I don't know if you entered the Little Marks um, event, the rabbit event with the videos. I only appreciated that aspect more than a, the other virtual shows I've seen because it was a video where you had to pose the animal and take your hands off and show all angles. So we could truly see if that rabbit looked good or not. If we're only looking at an animal from the side profile, right? We're just looking at the side profile. Well, we don't know how wide this animal is. We don't know how deep the animal, well, I guess we know how deep it is from the side profile, excuse me, I misspoke, but we really need to evaluate all angles of that rabbit. Um, because each angle of that rabbit is described in our standard. I'll do the best I can here to, hold on, let me see if I can, get on top of him see those ugly long shoulders that's awful um and that's one reason he probably won't stay but um and we can make him look good if i get my hands on him and scrunch him up and don't let go i i can make him look pretty good so i mean truly you got to look at the animal from every angle one piece of advice i learned a while ago and, and i and i don't practice that in my barn is you could actually put a mirror on the other side of your grooming table. So that way when you're uh, posing your animal, you can look at the animal from both views, from all views. Does that make sense? So um, if you're just starting out, there might be something you want to think about, putting a mirror on the other side of your animal so you can see a different view than what you're seeing from here. I also think a lot of judges judge from top down sometimes uh, really tall judges, and also depends on table height too. You know, we can't bend over 300 times a day, kills our back. Um, but that's why top view is important, that taper, the width, the side view is important. We really gotta, we gotta assess the whole animal. Does that help? I don't yeah, know. yeah, it does. <laughs> okay, all right, give me another one. Okay, uh, what would you say is like the best way to get them to stand still, like after you work with them? Uh, on, I think working with them from their li when they're little. You know, I think that there's sometimes people um, think that they don't need to handle the rabbits often, that rabbits are easy. I think if you work with your rabbit constantly, um, that they're going to be used to being handled. I think also it, it depends if they're built correctly. If your rabbit has a really, really tight chest and a narrow shoulder, they're going to be pushing themselves up quite a bit because because they, 
or you're restricting their airflow when you're pushing them down and their chest is so tight. So the animal has to be built correctly, number one. You have to work with them quite a bit too. Um, I always tell people that if the animal feels safe, that they're going to, that they're not going to flop around a lot, okay? So hold on to your rabbit's ears, hold on to their loin pretty tightly so they feel safe when, you, when, you're, when you're posing and flipping and handling them. Make sense? Yeah. I will also say the other thing that's really important, and I think I brought them, are these little babies. Toenail clippers are so important. And there's nothing that infuriates. I'm gonna get onto my soapbox here, a little rant. I don't know how much time we have, but I can't stand it when I get to a show and I see people tattooing the rabbits. I see people trimming toenails. Those things need to be done at home a couple days in advance. We're trying to reduce the amount of stress we put on our animals so they look their best, they feel their best, they show off their best. When you're there clipping, 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 they're scared. You trim the wicks too short, they're bleeding all over. Well, now they don't look their best. These things need to happen at home and they need to happen. I don't think an animal poses or look its, looks its best if they've got these big daggers on them. And if you come in my barn, I mean, you're gonna see, oh, I mean, their toenails are trimmed pretty short. All right, I do it consistently. I don't do it at the show. I do it before I get to the show, all right? And all those things play into, uh, into your husbandry, your grooming. Wouldn't you say is like the best way and time to breed a buck because I've been having trouble with them just not doing it right even though the doe is lifting. Okay so we're gonna get a little PG-13 here. I think that um, rabbits are induced ovulators. That means they don't cycle like humans do, right? They don't have a, a once a month time when they can get pregnant really. That we can, by the act of stimulation, we can make rabbits ovulate. It's called like breeding like rabbits because they can breed almost any time of the year. So a little stimulation from behind often helps uh, a doe um, get ready to ovulate. Um, one thing you could try, and it, and it might sound cruel, but I'm gonna suggest it, is um, table breeding. You know, once you kind of stimulate the doe, and this is a buck here, you know, you stimulate her, you get her ovulating, you get her ready we can actually kind of hold her down and let the buck do his thing right on the table. Um, you can do that in the cage too, where you kind of hold the doe and you let the buck mount her and fall off. Um, and I'm sure some people are gonna totally disagree with that practice, but that's how I breed probably 90% of my rabbits is I actually hold the doe down just so she doesn't go crazy and run around the cage. And, and sometimes that act actually really does help help her ovulate too, um, but I, I like to table braid or just hold the doe down in the cage, let the buck mount her a couple of times and then put her away. So that would be my recommendation. Like I said, they're induced ovulators, so you could put the doe in a buck's cage maybe overnight and see if that helps stimulate her enough to, to get going. If your doe is old and fat, you might wanna put her on a diet I like to breed my does when they're young. That goes into, you know, constantly having babies and uh, I like to breed them when they're young, you know, six months, seven months. Uh, thank you. All right. Yeah. Th thank, you thank you, Johnny. And I, I think that wraps, wraps up the you, session. If I, if I had a doe I wanted to breed, I'd show you right here. <laughs> All right, yeah, I don't know. I hope I answered your questions. Let me just quickly summarize um, everything we talked about because I think it's important. Number one, knowing your standard, having your standard available, knowing you know, what, what are breed specific words. I'd honestly go back and I'd find these words and I'd circle them, highlight them in my standard all the time. I'm, I'm starring things. I circle things, I write notes. Every time I go to a show or talk to a breeder, I write notes in my standard. It's always a mess. Um, number two, timing. Timing being that you are breeding for old juniors, young seniors, that you know when the show is. Number three is grooming, conditioning. 
um, I didn't even mention this, but this is gonna be one of your most important things. That's a scale. You know, you're spending $15 for an entry. Don't wait to the show to realize your rabbit's overweight because then it's too late. Um, but constantly grooming the fur, constantly grooming uh, toenails and uh, feeding a high quality feed. I feed a feed with 18% protein, really makes him feel good. Um, like I said, you need a little luck on your side and uh, then you might win convention. <laughs> All right, thank you.